honor to interview, I mean, to introduce Shannon Brownlee. She is the Senior Vice President of the Loan Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the belief that health care exists for the benefit of patients, communities, and nations. She's the co-founder of the Right Care Alliance, a grassroots coalition of clinicians, patients, and community members organizing to make healthcare institutions accountable to their communities and put patients at the heart of healthcare. And finally, she's the author of Overtreated, Why Too Much Medicine is Making Us Sicker and Poorer. Please welcome Shannon Brownlee. Thank you, Darcy. Um, whose idea was it to have me go after Harlan? <laughs> um, George Burns once said a great sermon, the secret to a great sermon is having a good beginning and a good ending and not very much in between. And I think the same is probably true of final keynotes um, after such an extraordinary day. So I'm going to do my best to end and begin well and to keep the middle to a minimum. And I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you what I'm going to talk about. I have two main goals, to praise the work that you are doing and set it into the wider context of the radical transformation of healthcare that has to happen if we're going to get a system that is accountable to patients and communities, that's affordable, effective, and universal. Everybody in, nobody out. My second goal is to recruit you. Co-founding well, the RCA um, has been a really wonderful experience and now we are growing rapidly. We have 11 councils and we have um, chapters forming or already formed in half a dozen cities. And so I would like nothing more at the end of this talk than for all of you to go to the Right Care Alliance, www.rightcarealliance.org, and join. So why am I passionate about this work? Um, there are lots of reasons, but one of them is the care that my father got um, over the last 25 years of his life. And I've seen the best of medicine and I've seen the worst of it. My father um, uh, developed a meningioma in his 50s. Uh, nobody knew why he was having these terrible, terrible headaches. And finally, my stepmother took him to the local community hospital and there was this new machine there. It was called a CAT scan, and it was able to see that he had a brain tumor. He was taken to the nearest big city, which was Boise, Idaho. He was in surgery the next day. He ended up having three brain surgeries, but it saved his life. This is the miracle of medicine. Um, but then about 20 years later, 15 or 20 years later, he, um, he was prescribed a statin. And he was prescribed a statin because his cholesterol level was here, and the level that was acceptable moved. And so all of a sudden, he was prescribed a statin. And he started f having muscle weakness. And at the time, uh, physicians had not really been adequately informed of the commonness of a serious side effect called rhabdomyolysis. His muscles were breaking down. He was at a, an event that he had looked forward to his entire life, a show of Chinese art. And halfway through, he said to my brother, I can't go on. He was hospitalized on dialysis for three weeks and came out with just one kidney. And that was the beginning of a, a long slide. Fast forward two years ago, he'd been falling down. He was increasingly despondent. My stepmother hid the gun. Um, he was um, becoming, he was incontinent. He would tell anybody he could that he was done being alive. And he developed a condition that could be corrected a couple of times, but then after that, the only alternative was surgery. And this was a man who was really quite frail. And he spent 10 of his last 20 days in the hospital. I asked my brother, who was out there in Portland, Oregon with him, to, um, to ask for a palliative care consult. And the hospitalist said, we're not there yet. And so he had to undergo a nuclear stress test to see if he was prepared for a surgery that when the gastrointestinal surgeon finally saw him said, there's no way I will do surgery on this man. He will either end up dead or on the operating table or in a nursing home for the rest of his short life. So finally we got that palliative care consult and finally we were able to take him home where he died 10 days later. So I've seen the best and I've seen the worst. And I suspect that each of you has an experience that brings you here. You have a story to tell. Randy Oster, Darcy, Dave DeBroncart, Pat Masters, 
um, Jerry Rose uh, Bomblatt. We all have stories of being misdiagnosed or ignored or not listened to, and maybe most important of all, not being heard. Anatole Broyard was an editor at the New York Times, and he wrote about the patient's plight in a brilliant essay that he published in August of 1990, three months before he died of prostate cancer. And he said, to most physicians, my illness is a routine incident in their rounds. For me, it's the crisis of my life, and I would feel better if I had a doctor who at least perceived the incongruity. Later, he says, I just wish my doctor would brood on my situation for even five minutes, that we, he would give me his whole mind just once. I'd like my doctor to scan me. I'd like my doctor to grope my spirit as well as my prostate. And what Broyard so eloquently expressed can be summed up as a crisis of relationship, a fracturing of the therapeutic alliance that we know is essential to offering comfort to patients, but it's also part of healing. Because we all know implicitly that healing involves far more than knowledge and skill. It's more than making a correct diagnosis, and it's more than delivering the right treatment. True healing is a process by which a doctor helps a patient accept, recover from, adapt to, or endure a serious illness. And it is full of nuance and mystery. Journalist David Bornstein writes, I was often moved by how much my father-in-law, an actor who died from leukemia, how much he drew comfort and even inspiration from the relationship he had with his hematologist who asked for a Shakespeare verse at every visit. Or as my colleague Vikas Sani says, he's a cardiologist, hope and healing come from the companionship between doctor and patient in facing an unknown future together. And the therapeutic alliance is a two-way street. And destruction of it hurts the other people, the people on the other side of the stethoscope. You in white coats, you have stories too of being burned out and chewed up by the system. Nearly half of medical students report feelings of depression, burnout, cynicism. And medical education has been characterized as akin to being a member of an abusive and neglectful family. In places, it places unrealistic expectations on students. It keeps them sleep deprived, overstressed, hyper competitive, and in state of fear of making a mistake. It sends a message that doubt or grief should be kept to oneself. And worse, young clinicians perceive the gap between the proclaimed values, the ethics of empathy, altruism, compassion, and what they actually learn through, through the hidden curriculum. This is the socialization process that doctors and nurses undergo. And increasingly, it teaches them detachment rather than connection. The hidden curriculum says that money is what matters in the system and that the doctors who make the most money are the happiest and the ones to be admired. It teaches young clinicians to see patients as customers or consumers. And it is teaching residents to do rounds in the hospital in the hallway looking at their laptops rather than at the bedside of the patient. It's doing a terrible job of teaching young clinicians to take a history and physical. In fact, Abraham Verghese at Stanford University is running remedial courses for young doctors, young residents who are coming out of medical school without the essential skills of history taking and physicals. So how can such an education system teach clinicians to perceive the incongruity, as Broyard put it? Or how can it teach them to understand what it means to be sick versus well, or to take five minutes to brood on their patients with their whole selves? And as the work speeds up and clinicians are treated more like assembly line workers than healing professionals, there's less and less time to grope for the spirit of a patient to serve as a companion in the face of an uncertain future. Productivity is measured in terms of patient throughput, and burnout has reached fever pitch. What all of this means is the topics of today's meeting strike at the emotional and spiritual heart of what it means to be a nurse, a doctor, a physician's assistant. But it also speaks to the deep need of a patient or a family member to be heard and to be cared for as a fellow human being who is suffering. 
and what you are all doing here, Randy, Darcy, Tom Del Banco, Harlan, Matthew Holtz, all of the amazing people who are in this room today, the researchers and physicians and patients who've been laboring in these fields for so many years, every single one of you deserves a medal for making these deep and important issues rise to the surface, for giving voice to patients and to the clinicians, giving voice to the clinicians who care about their patients as well as for their patients. And yet, here we are, struggling still to make these voices heard by our colleagues, by our regulators, by our politicians. Why has it been so hard to get open notes implemented everywhere? Why is it so hard to get shared decision-making implemented? We heard some of the reasons today from Harlem. Why doesn't every medical and nursing school in the country teach real history taking? How is it that shared decision-making has been on its way in for 20 years? Why doesn't every medical school in the country teach it? Why have all of the studies that have found that it's better than what we're doing now in terms of informing patients, why, isn't, why aren't decision aids used more often? Why are these ideas still lurking at the fringes of medicine? Why do so few hospitals have family advisory councils? And, how, and, how, and even fewer of them have family advisory councils that actually have power. And if you dig even deeper, we can ask the question, why aren't hospitals accountable to their communities? Where I live in Washington, D.C., there are three proton beam accelerator machines at three hospitals, and a fourth is being built. This is a $100 million machine that is useful for a tiny number of childhood cancers. And if shared decision-making actually had been implemented in any of these hospitals, they wouldn't make any money on them because patients would understand that they don't add value, they just add cost. So there are two main reasons that shared decision-making isn't implemented, family advisory councils haven't been implemented, open notes are not standard practice, and they are the same reasons there's no community advisory councils to prevent every hospital in the country from buying a $100 million machine. And those reasons are money and power. And we in this room don't have very much of either one. So we don't have power as individual patients in the clinic. It is incredibly hard for ad to advocate for ourselves. I mean, really, I'm about as informed a patient as you can get, and I'm about as informed a family member as you can get, and I find it incredibly hard to challenge physicians still. And even doctors who become patients discover that it's incredibly hard to challenge. So the idea that patient customers are going to change the system one transaction at a time has become part of our national religion of the free market. It's part of the catechism of consumerism. We've all been absorbing this catechism for 40 years. Patients can fix the system if only they would act more like consumers. High deductibles will make sick people and frightened people more prudent consumers of health care. And when all those prudent consumers start voting with their wallets, the system will be transformed. Right. How's that been working for us? Here's an alternative. We can only do so much as individuals, even brilliant, charismatic leaders like Harlan, like Tom Del Banco, like all the people that have done so much in healthcare. They can't scale up what they're doing very easily. Maybe it's time to think about a different theory of change. Now, I'm going to suggest that the change we seek will come about only if we pursue collective action. This December, it will be 62 years since a seamstress named Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus. Her refusal and subsequent arrest is just one of, one of the many iconic acts of defiance that have come to symbolize the civil rights movement. And that movement is ongoing and its business is unfinished. But think back to the 1950s and 60s. What an extraordinary distance we've come because of collection, collective action by very brave people. And it's tempting to imagine that all that was triggered by a seamstress who was tired one day and decided she wasn't going to sit at the back of the bus. But that's not really what happened. 
Rosa Parks, a pivotal act of defiance, was carefully planned, and it was preceded by years of grassroots organizing that came before. In the first half of the 20th century, African Americans and their allies mostly fought discrimination through litigation and lobbying, and they set important legal precedents. Yet the victories in the courts and the legislation didn't move things fast enough. The dream of civil rights only began to make real headway when the activists shifted tactics to real movement building and organizing. And that organizing began in the black churches. It began when people talked about the lived experience of racism. It was in those churches that people began to form the bonds that made them brave enough to register to vote in the face of police intimidation. Those relationships gave them the courage to face down dogs and water cannons and imprisonment for their cause. It was grassroots organizing that created the bus boycott that followed Rosa Parks' action. It was organizing that brought white students from the north to register black voters and join marches. And it was the endless press releases sent by organizers that made those marchers impossible for the world and the US Congress to ignore. If civil rights movement had stayed in the churches and not moved to the next phase, imagine what the world would be like today. So what we are doing at this meeting serves the same purpose as the years of discussion that happened in the black churches before the movement, tr movement truly began. Now it is time to consider the next phase of our cause, and that is real organizing and mobilizing. Because getting shared decision making to be standard of care and fostering true therapeutic relationships and giving patients control over their records and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the things you've talked about and that you know are possible those, will, those are not just technical problems with technical solutions, and there are technical solutions out there. They are also natural outgrowths from a healthcare system that's become another business, and a very powerful one, and one that really doesn't want to change. This is a fight about money and power, and people don't generally give those up. I mean, George Washington apparently gave up being king of America because he knew it was the right thing to do for democracy, but that doesn't happen that often. And institutions definitely don't give up power and money unless they have to. So we need a real movement that's willing to break glass, step on toes, picket hospitals, and force the deep change that's necessary. We need, health care needs, a Rosa Parks moment. So here comes my pitch to join the Right Care Alliance. We're just beginning to build our ranks of providers, patients, lawyers, community activists. Our steering committee has started to lay out our strategy for the coming years. But I have to be honest with you. We are hardly the only grassroots healthcare organization out there, and you can join any number of them. And you can be as active in what they do or as inactive as you like and just be a member. You can join the National Physicians Alliance, which is starting to allow non-physicians in. You can join any of the other single-payer organizations that exist in every state. It almost doesn't matter what group you get involved with, because eventually we're all going to have to start working together towards the same goals and pool our efforts. And our first step will be to go into communities and help Americans understand what's really going on in healthcare today. They don't understand it. They're just getting a little inkling of why it costs so much and really how not very good it is. So, and for those of us who are old enough to remember the 60s, we need teach-ins. We need healthcare teach-ins. And every one of us can be involved in that effort. Getting, getting to a system that opens doors to patients, being active participants can no longer be left to the healthcare industry or even to healthcare professionals, and it can't be accomplished by patients acting as individual consumers. At least I don't believe it can. That's all necessary, but it's not sufficient. The demand for change has to come from the American people, from students, from workers, from community activists, from business leaders, the clergy, and clinicians and patients. All those who are affected by healthcare's failure to deliver, and that's all of us. So in closing, I want to pay homage to the incredible work that all of you have done and will continue to do. But to achieve our goals, we must take the next step 
towards activism and organizing. And I invite you to get involved. Thank you. Hey, and I think I finished early. Good. <laughs> Got us back on time. I'm happy to take any questions, discussion. Um, I'd love to start a conversation about this. Or I'd love to go get a drink with you. Hi, Matthew. <laughs> Shannon, Shannon you, know, you know, I'm a huge fan, and I hate to bring this up, but since you wrote the most amazing book, Overtreated over Christ. Uh, Overtreated. Thank you. I was going to say there's about five at the same time. He was the first person to anyway, write about my book. Um, there's been kind of an academic backlash against the sort of the Wenberg mantra. Um, Kip Sullivan, Steve Summerai, a bunch of other people have written sort of saying that, oh, no, we're not overtreated, we're undertreated. Can you kind of give us a state of play of where that is? Because if you need to connect the fact that it's not very good and it costs too much, it's because we have too many proton beam therapies and we're doing too much. And I'm seeing a bunch of people say, well, the data behind the Dartmouth stuff was wrong. If you combine Medicare data with the public, with the other data, et cetera. Et cetera. You know, do you know what I'm saying? There is yeah. a backlash against it. Can you give me your, your, your suggestion of where you think the argument currently is? Because if we can't, quote unquote, win that argument, it's going to be very hard to take it to the people. Well, I, you know, th there's been a backlash against the Dartmouth work, and yet there's also been confirmation that what Jack has been saying for many, many years, number one, that there's a lot of overtreatment. And by the way, you can have both at the same time. We just published four papers in The Lancet about undertreatment and overtreatment around the world. And what we found is that in every country we looked at, whether it was high income or low income or middle income, both are happening. Undertreatment and overtreatment. Lack of access and too much care. They happen simultaneously. They can happen in the same health system, in the same hospital, in the same patient. And by the way, um, patients who are on Medicaid are slightly more likely to get unnecessary services than patients who are, who are on Medicare or privately insured. So, the, you know, the, the backlash against Dartmouth, well, what do you expect from a bunch of hospitals that don't like the news? They don't like the fact that they're overcharging, that they're delivering a lot of unnecessary services. UCLA, Jack predicted that what was going to happen at UCLA, he predicted this five years ago, when UCLA increased the number of ICU beds by one-third, he said, they're going to have a lot more ICU admissions. A study just came out about six months ago that found that 50% of those admissions were inappropriate. The patient was too sick, so it was futile and a waste of money and a torturous way to die, or the patient was too well and all they could do was expose them to risk. So, yeah, there's been a backlash. I'm not real worried about it. So today we talked about the problems in health care we realize that alone, or the people in this room, we can't make the changes. And Shannon, you've given us a method or a way for us to join together. And I just want to share, I just did the Right Care Alliance, um, an event in our local library last week. And I can tell you that the public, they do not know everything we know that's wrong with this system. But I was shocked at the level of understanding that they had with the problems and 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 they didn't know where to turn and so i guess what i'd like to challenge this group is it was really easy to just get a handful of people together and just let them have that conversation and i thought maybe you can just briefly talk a little bit about what happened last week with the right care and um maybe people will see that for next year um they can get involved as well uh, Randy Oster, thank you so much. You are an amazing member of the Right Care Alliance, and she's been sort of single-handedly doing teach-ins in Connecticut, which is fantastic. Um, so last week was Right Care Action Week, and we had 78 events around the country, and one of them was even in Haiti. And people did a variety of things. Um, some people handed out cards in the clinic and the emergency room that said, what worries you most about health care costs? And these cards, this is the third year we've done that the, the people have done this card thing where they hand patients these cards and they get amazing answers. 
And it's a moment, it opens a moment of conversation between clinician and patient about something that isn't just, you know, these are your symptoms, I've got to diagnose you. Um, the, uh, we did one in Washington, D.C., Right Care, D.C. We built a paper mache screw that was about this tall. And uh, we had a banner that said, feeling screwed by high health care costs? Come talk to us. <laughs> And we got, you know, we got people who signed up, and we got great conversations. Um, if you belong to a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a, a temple, anything, that is an opportunity to talk to people about what you understand about healthcare and hear from them. And it is the process of having this conversation. This is the lived experience of the system that helps us start to make the personal bonds that are really the glue of, of real social movement. There's a lot of quote movements in healthcare. It's not really going to move anything unless it really starts using these very tried and true methods of social movements and mobilization. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm um, going to keep it brief. I um, wanted to ask you what your thought is on precision medicine. I think it's absolutely the wrong thing we're doing. I think there's there's two precision medicines, just like there's two Americas. Uh, Van Jones on CNN had talked about how there's the aspirational America that we all are part of and believe in, and it's the future that gets us going every day. But then there's also the reality of America and the failures of us to address our original sins of um, what happens to Native Americans and slavery and still not being addressed today. So in the same way, I think participatory medicine offers a much better future than precision medicine. There's so much energy going into precision medicine, but it's precision for whom we can use precision to generate really expensive cancer drugs, but we have children in Flint without access to clean water. Um, so just, I'm very against precision medicine in its current context, and so I was wondering what your thoughts on how participatory medicine can move us away from the wrong vision of precision medicine. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for saying that because I think precision medicine right now is just one more sales pitch. I mean, frankly, I think shared decision making should have stolen personalized medicine. But um, precision medicine, as you say, is, is yeah, it's, it's the future a long, long time from now. And yes, there are some really fabulous cancer drugs that are coming out, but they're ridiculously priced. People can't afford them. And in fact, if we actually wanted a healthy population, we'd take half the money we spend on health care and we'd put it into communities for social determinants of health. Yeah. But here's the tricky part. We don't have a mechanism for doing that. And that's part of what has to happen in this country is a movement that says, get the money out of the hospital. It's like if Willie, Sutton, if Willie Sutton were alive today, that's where he'd be getting money, out of the hospitals, because that's where the money is. So thank you. That's a hint. Please join me for thanking Shannon. <laughs>